Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Pathfinder, a podcast by Payload, the leading digital media company in the space industry. I'm your host, Mo Islam, and today we're joined by Tim Ellis, the co-founder and CEO of Relativity Space. Tim and I chat Terran One's maiden flight back in March, the transition to Terran R, the company's future on Mars, expanding human consciousness, and even electronic music. There's a lot we have to get through, so let's jump right in. Spider Oak's Orbit Secure software is designed for hybrid space operators struggling to manage the chaos of securing data flow and access to and from tens of thousands of small satellites in low Earth orbit. Using a unique combination of end-to-end zero-trust encryption and blockchain distributed ledger, Orbit Secure allows your mission to orchestrate and secure Earth-to-orbit, orbit-to-Earth transmission, communication, and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure hybrid space environments. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero-trust security and resiliency to your zero-gravity environments, check out SpiderOak at www.spideroak.com. Tim, welcome back to the show. Awesome. Good to see you, Matt. So I want to rewind the clock back to March of 2023. I assume you're in the control room um, waiting for Terran One's first launch. What's going through your head? Uh, yeah, that was, that was probably about the most existential adrenaline I've ever felt. I will say for me personally, there wasn't a lot to do on that day. I mean, we had a very large and well-trained team, so certainly I was kind of a passenger in the passenger seat um, watching the launch. But uh, yeah, I, I think I've told this story a little bit, but I'll tell it here. So when I started Relativity, I was very young, um, 25, like freshly 25. And my co-founder was 22. He had worked at SpaceX and we had both met at the USC Rocket Lab. Um, but because I was so busy in the, the USC Rocket Lab building our own rockets in college, I never stopped to go watch a SpaceX launch. And when I worked at Blue Origin, they had never done an orbital launch. Uh, which is still true today. Um, but so I had never seen a rocket orbit a launch before. So when I started Relativity, I told myself kind of masochistically that it was going to have to be my own company, you know, from my own and my team's hands to make my own rocket. Uh, to, to watch my first launch. So I had many trips out to the Cape where I, you know, SpaceX was launching and I kind of ducked and looked the other way and closed my ears and, you know, wanted to, wanted to make it Relativity's launch is the first one I ever saw. Uh, of course, I've seen tons of engine tests and things like that. But um, so, so when the, the launch happened, of course, you know, right when it was clear the hold down clamps were retracting and this thing was flying, I ran out the back door, um, ran, ran kind of down the stairs around the corner to see it with my own two eyes. And of course, it was an amazing experience. You could feel it in your chest way before you could actually see it. Um, and it was, you know, very alive. Like the, the sound, of course, was, you know, quite special and seeing the the blue fire uh, rise up slowly um, was was pretty amazing. But I, but I was pretty head in, head in the game. I mean, I knew we had to get past the 80 second mark, which is max Q to prove the structural viability. Uh, you know, that was really the, the company's goal and what I thought was most important. My personal goal is that we did make it to space. Uh, and so we successfully did that as well. That was kind of above and beyond what we set strategically with our customers, investors, and, and the company. But yeah, it was very, uh, very thrilling night. That's for sure. Pretty surreal for quite a few days. Yeah, I think it's pretty... Uh, so, so, so that was literally your first launch that you've ever seen. Like, With my own two eyes, yes. Of course, I've seen a million live streams and you know, sure. YouTubes and that sort of thing. And uh, I will say, actually, engine tests, in my opinion, are more intense um, only because of the safe, it's called QD or quantity distance. So, so the safety keep out zone and blast over pressure zone for an engine is much smaller. So you can actually stand a lot closer uh, than you are for a launch. So engine tests are you know, quite a bit more visceral. They're also several minutes long. So you're, you know, close for the whole duration versus the rocket flying goes out of the way. Um, so some engine tests get uncomfortable towards the end because it's, you know, so loud and so intense for so long that, you know, your kind of fight or flight, you know, adrenaline kicks in and you, you sort of want to leave depending on what it is you're watching. Um, but yeah, first launch. I saw, I saw, I saw an engine test once and I made the huge mistake of not wearing, um, uh, earplugs. 
Oh, that is an unbelievably was, big mistake. I, I wear double well, earplugs. You wear earplugs and then ear muffs over it. Uh, but yeah, by the I, way, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. But with AON, our engine testing, um, it was just at Stena Space Center. There was one time yeah. where, early where we set off a car alarm in a city 35 miles away because the humidity and clouds <laughs> were just right. And uh, NASA, yeah, NASA employees told us a car alarm went off. So it's pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Um, all right, well, we will, we'll definitely get to that. Um, yeah. Just just on flight one, right? So yeah. you, you you reach space, uh, space. there was an issue with the, the um, uh, stage two vac, uh, vacuum optimized engine. Yeah. Um, w- did you guys ever, um, well, I'm sure you did, but what actually, what went wrong and what type of data did you gather from flight one? Yeah, of course. So ha- happy to talk about it. And we're still working with um, FAA to get kind of all of our report put out there. And so certainly want to lean on that and, and respect our partners. Um, but but uh, yeah, so f- first off, you know, in almost every way, we felt this was the best first launch in history from a privately backed company. So this was, you know, fairly large first rocket, um, you know, over 200,000 pounds thrust to take off, the first LUX methane fueled rocket to fly outside of China, which had just done it in December, um, you know, just a few months before us. And then, of course, 3D printing. So lots of pretty ambitious stuff. Uh, we were very happy we made it all the way through the first stage flight, second stage separation, which all was clean. Um, and then the second stage engine attempted to ignite, but didn't. So the igniters fired. Uh, that all looked nominal. But then at the point of, you know, really, I should explain kind of even from the testing process, you know, the second stage ignition was probably on my personal list of the top watch and risk items for a first flight, because you just don't have flight dynamics data. You're going about 7,450 kilometers an hour. Uh, You're in the vacuum of space. You just went from a very high multi-G acceleration environment to when it stage separates, you're in the near vacuum of space. So you actually then are close to zero Gs. And you actually do want to provide some acceleration so the the, uh, propellants settle at the bottom of the tanks. So that way you don't ingest gas, you only ingest liquid. Um, Turbo pumps are really designed to only work on liquid because it's much more dense. So once you suck in uh, gas bubbles because the density is so much lower, the power at the turbine end of the the, uh, turbo pump will just be set based on, you know, basically what's called spin start. Uh, so that that's a fixed quantity. And then so on the impeller end, if you're ingesting liquid, that kind of power matches properly and it, it spools up properly. But if you ingest gas, it's way too much power at the turbine end. So it will overspin. So you spin way too fast. And at the time you start spinning too quickly, then all of the liquid that then would be coming into the impeller actually turns into gas again. It's called cavitation. This is a bit of a technical answer, but it's called cavitation. Uh, and so th- that's a phenomenon that then once it starts, it actually just continues because then all the liquid becomes gas, which makes it spin even faster, which means even more gas is created in cavitation. So it, so it kind of is a, it's like a failed startup sequence and, and way to bootstrap the engine if you have too much gas at the beginning. So that's what ended up happening. We ingested a gas bubble. Um, and then partially the reason that, that this was also caused, you know, you kind of see in the video, the methane is, is burning a little bit. Like there was some ignition because there is, you know, some fuel and oxidizer flowing into the engine. It was just the wrong quantities, the wrong kind of phase um, being gas. But then um, we also had a valve that just opened slower than expected. Um, a lot of the stuff we really try to shake out in ground testing, that, that actual engine that flew had already done two full flight duration engine tests. So we do one engine only test uh, and acceptance testing. And then we do with that exact engine on uh, the second stage, a flight duration second stage test as part of the qualification and acceptance of uh, stage two. So all of the engines that flew actually had already done several full flight duration tests. So it wasn't like a, a fundamental kind of design flaw. Um, the, the bubble ingestion would have some design changes that we already 
you know, pretty quickly knew how we would fix that particular issue. Uh, so th these are the kind of things that you really do have to fly to get the data now that we have the data and have that learning. Um, even though Terran R is a much larger rocket, and we'll talk about the move on to Terran R, it's a much bigger rocket, but we have the some critical learning and company experience now about this phenomenon so that we will not uh, make the same mistakes and, and kind of have that same failure mode for even for Terran R, even though it's a bigger rocket. It, a lot of the lessons learned are all transportable to that vehicle. And we just want to make sure we're building the rocket that solves the core customer problem. Great. Now, it, it, so, so you, were, you were so close to getting to orbit. So close. It was very close. The, per, the performance was such that if stage two lit, we would have achieved orbit. So, yeah. It's, Absolutely. It's Absolutely. So, so, so when I heard that you guys weren't going to attempt a second Terran one rocket, a Terran one launch. I was shocked. So walk me through, you know, walk me through sort of that decision making process because you were so close. And um, I'm not trying to trivialize the the problem yeah. um, and the issue, but it sounds like one that you've you've you you guys have created a solution for already or, or are already thinking through. Yeah, so this is kind of in the camp of certainly an advantage of being a private company. Uh, there's always a little bit of. Um, I don't know if dramatic irony is the right word, but there's always a little bit of things happening in the background that then you know, make their way to the surface later. Uh, so from this perspective, we've actually really been working on transitioning to Terran R and leaning into Terran R for a long time. So Terran R is a now over three year old development program. We've had hundreds of people working on it. We've already spent hundreds of millions of dollars towards this program for some period of time. So it's no secret relativity's raised a large amount of capital Capital. We have a lot of people. So many have been working on Terran R, Aon R, all things related to that uh, for, for some time. And this is true of customers as well. So our backlog of Terran R customers is now $1.8 billion today. At the time of Terran 1 first launch, it was pretty close to that. It was, I think, around $1.6 billion in, in that ballpark. So it's quite big. So we had already been hearing and understanding from customers like we really want to be a customer focused rocket company i think as a as a commercial entity like certainly we have you know big visions mars you know 3d printing uh, reusable rockets like these are all you know fantastic things i'm excited about as an engineer and as a product person but really i want to build the next great launch company and it's clear to customers that needs to happen so we'll, we'll talk about that more in detail but it, it was clear to customers there had to be a second quickly moving, disruptive, commercially uh, competitive launch company that's not named SpaceX. SpaceX is phenomenally successful, but they're really kind of an N of one right now in the industry and, and there's not a clear second player. And so there had to be that. And so, you know, we were really leaning into this and, and then we just went and asked our customers after that first launch. Uh, we did have a second rocket for Terran one that was um, built and, and, you know, a large part of the way through production. So we would have been ready to do a second flight if the first flight was not good enough and did not prove enough to move on to Terran R. But we really just listened to customers. So both currently signed and then prospective customers at that point in time, um, which we're now you know, under negotiation with, of course, a bunch of additional customers besides the ones we've announced. And we wanted them to tell us, you know, did that prove enough for you to have confidence to do Terran R? Because they were telling us Terran R is really the only rocket that solves their core problem. We had sold a few hundred million dollars of Terran ones uh, to some pretty marquee customers. I think Iridium, uh, Telesat, you know, th those were some of the, the most public, but we had announced quite a few deals for Terran one. Uh, so it, it was a product with a market. I would say the one ton payload launch vehicle class does have a market. It's just not nearly as big as this kind of crisis that's happening in supply demand for the medium to heavy lift reusable uh, ro rocket class. And so, um, yeah, it was honestly just a, a business decision that leaning into the switch from Terran 1 to Terran R meant we could put 100% of our company focus on the right product. Customers need it. You know, 2026 is our first launch date. If we could launch in 2025, people would certainly buy much more of them for Terran R. It'd be more optimal. So I think we're already, um, you know, at the right window. But 
like people need this quite bad because there's actually a launch shortage currently and a lot of the new launch vehicles are getting delayed and um, i know these are all things we'll expand on but but the high level strategy decision because it is an important one is that we thought by being more focused on the right product and we wouldn't gain that much more from getting to orbit because we were pretty dang close on this first launch it wouldn't increase customer confidence um, our team would be pretty, you know, not, not super distracted, but it would have still taken a good amount of people to focus on doing a second launch. Um, and, you know, we, we, we felt we had the momentum on Terranar already because uh, we had already been doing engine testing and component testing of, of that engine. So it, it was it was a audacious move, but that's one of our core company values. And I think so far it's paid off. Um, you know, in uh, kind of investor communities, customer communities, talent communities so far, that has not been a serious concern, at least from what I've heard. Um, no, that's that's good to hear. So uh, I, I and I understand I certainly understand the customer side of, of your the, the equation here. I am curious, um, especially since you just mentioned mentioned the investor. Um, how, how are investors thinking about, or are they okay pushing out sort of an orbital proof point, right? Because, and I asked that from the, from a, even a broader perspective that like, you know, you have, you have a number of competitors. Um, everyone's trying to get to that point that they can say, Hey, we reached orbit, right? So that they can get, take that proof point, mm, yeah. go to the investor and say, we're one of the few that did this. Does that, yeah. has that been a challenge or has that been a pushback from investors so far? Yeah, this is this is an interesting question because um, you know it's something I've actually found through running relativity the last eight years is somewhat counterintuitive. I think to be very clear, the ultimate goal is yes, you must have a reliable reach orbit with the right payload, launching bunches of customers and an attractive price point uh, company. Like that is the business we're in. You must be able to do that. So I think that's that's hopefully obvious to people and, and not lost on me. Um, but how you how you get there and with what product you get there with is actually very important. So, you know, there, there certainly are companies out there. Um, I think, you know, SpaceX is SpaceX is the NF1 in my mind. It's really the only large scale, commercially successful, disruptive launch company out there. Rocket Labs launched a bunch of rockets successfully. I think that's really impressive engineering. It's not a super interesting financial picture, uh, and I think they've even talked about it as such that there's just not a lot of demand for that payload size. And candidly, that rocket about, was about a tenth of the size of what Terran One even was, so it's very, very small. Um, and, and the CubeSat market is just not a very interesting market. So I think from an investor hat, what what we were seeing is, of course, getting to orbit would have been a huge proof point. I think that absolutely would have helped us. You know, being one of those few companies is very important. But weighing that against going to orbit with what is kind of the wrong product ultimately, like Terran One is interesting. It's just not that interesting relative to Terran R and building the next alternative to a Falcon Nine Starship. You know that that kind of product class um, and and you know really Falcon Nine is the only commercially successful large scale rocket in the world. It's by far the most successful rocket in history. And so I think that's the bar to go after um, and, and provide a diversified alternative to that that's not launching our own satellites. And so Terran R was just so interesting from a product market fit perspective and the total adjustable market is by our measure about 20 times larger for Terran R than it was for Terran 1. Um, so it's in the realm of you know $20 billion per year over the next decade of, of launches um, just with all the constellations that are being developed and those satellites only last three to five years in orbit so they have to be re replenished on a very frequent basis and uh, so I certainly would love to get into more of the market dynamics we're seeing. Um, but it was just very clear that Terranar and, and, and actually choosing product market fit and customer traction above all else uh, was what investors are looking for. Like, like some, somebody told me this early and I didn't appreciate it until now having lived it, um, but especially with you know deep tech or hard tech companies, which definitely space we're certainly in, uh, investors are actually definitely scared you can't execute the product to be clear like that is definitely a, a huge point of diligence and concern and, and they they look at and we have to we have to execute the product but actually they're even a little more concerned that you do execute the product they give you all the money and then nobody wants it 
like, that's the most expensive and slowest way to possibly fail is that you spend all the years developing this thing. It even works. And then nobody wants it. There's no good business at the end of it. And so for us, we've been very focused on that's why we've been so focused on winning customer traction. So of the 1.8 billion of deals we now have for Terranara, that's across nine different customers. We've only announced a few of them publicly. Intelsat was the latest, but I can say the other contracts are very similar to Intelsats of the world in the sense that they're quite blue chip companies. Um, we're very proud of, of this level of, you know, business that's very serious um, and, and you know, very established and working with relativity because that gives a lot of confidence. And we've won 100% of every deal we've gone after. Um, it's not all due to pricing either. Like we, you know, so, so have actually been increasing our pricing of Terranar as we've made sales, um, but, but we've gone head to head against every other existing and up and coming launch company in almost every deal. Uh, and, and, and the reason we've been able to win 100%, I think is just this relentless customer and product market fit focus to build sure. the, the, the right rocket. Yeah, look, I, th I, I think that makes sense. And I think it's a, a interesting way to look at it. And, and um, I think the, the, the idea behind um, spending all this capital and then not have a product as real, very real. I think you're starting to see that in the market for a lot of other companies. So um, anyway, let's let's uh, let's jump into Terranar. Um, mm -hmm. Talk sure. a little, give, give us a quick rundown of tech specs of of the vehicle, what to expect, um, and let's talk a little bit about ANR as well. Yeah, of course. So Terranar is a medium to heavy lift reusable launch vehicle. So we we took a lot of the same architecture choices from Terran 1 into Terran R. Uh, of course, there's also some changes and tweaks, especially based on flight data. I'd love, love to get into those. But at a high level, it's a uh, uh, you know, over 3.3 million pound thrust launch vehicle. It's 23 and a half uh, thousand kilograms to low Earth orbit. Um, depending on the orbital altitude, it's 20,000 20, kilograms uh, to 20,000 kilograms payload to LEO at 500 kilometer reference orbit. Um, and, and so kind of apples to apples, it's give or take about 30, 40% larger than the existing version of Falcon 9. Uh, and so this is really the, the kind of next step and evolution of what we see um, beyond that. So liquid oxygen, liquid methane, which is the same propellants as Terran 1, uh, really help reusability. So we're designing Terran R to be reused 20 times. Uh, that, that's really the, the kind of initial target. Now, how we actually do that, the core structure of the rocket will be designed for 20 reuses. And then the additional items like engines and valves and other things we can swap out will be designed for 10 reuses. So the, that, that helps make sure we don't have to engineer a perfect product from day one and gives us this kind of iterative uh, cushion so that we can actually go quickly and build hardware and launch because I think that's definitely a lesson I have learned as far as trying to build the perfect thing too 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 much out of the gate. Um, iteration is is really important. So it's a good mix of that. Um, but it has four uh, landing legs. They're passively deployed. So, so we're taking a bunch of smart ar architecture optimization decisions um, based on what we've seen is kind of you know, most proven best in class reusability today. Um, but we're still landing out at sea uh, on a ship. Um, so we're doing, we're, we're not planning for a return to launch site. Um, the biggest reason for that is I actually believe return to launch site will eventually just not be allowed. It, it may take a few years, but I think eventually it won't because the real estate at the Cape and at Kennedy Space Center is fairly limited. And so I think eventually all of the landing sites will just need to be converted to actual launch pads to get up mass. So landing at sea is a good optimization. Um, yeah, 13 engines way, on the... Oh, good. Uh, sorry, before we get into the engines. So you mentioned earlier about 20,000 kilograms to LEO. Um, yeah. That's in the reusable configuration, I assume. Is there yeah. a, what's the, yeah. what, what does it look like on the in, in an expendable configuration? Yeah, so, so I think I think the the kind of best apples to apples way of doing it without getting into orbital dynamics. So it's twenty three and a half tons of payload to Leo, and then it's thirty three and a half tons expendable. Got it. Okay. So it's definitely a heavy lift launch vehicle. As far as the the you know payload sizes we're talking about, uh, you know thirty three and a half certainly is squarely into heavy lift. Um, twenty three and a half is kind of right at heavy lift as well, um, but but towards the lower end of it. 
But it's big. But, but, but again, this is really customer driven. So we're just sizing for the number of satellites somebody wants in a single orbital plane and then the mass per satellite that is I- ideal. Um, we actually see mass per satellite increasing, not decreasing through successive generations of telecom constellations. Uh, the fundamental reason for this is similar to why rockets and other transportation technologies get better. The larger they get, it's just the square cubed law. And effect- effectively what that translates to is you just get much better unit economics per satellite, like a 10 times larger satellite is maybe 20 times better than, than, than um, you know, so, so it's not linear. So, so actually right, it's right. pushing people to have, you know, bigger and bigger. I think spacecraft will continue to get bigger and bigger over time um, because from a telecom perspective, their goal is to get from gigabits per second of total network capacity into the petabits. Like I think as an industry, that's what we should have as, as the North Star is how do we get to, you know, significantly higher total capacities because that's really the only way besides creative use of, of this, you know, kind of Leo telecom capacity, getting to just higher network throughput is how you get more users. Like it's very kind of fundamental. Um, just if you want to increase the total adjustable market of space and telecom, you have to get more users. And so that's one of the ways to do it. Um, so, so I really do have a strong belief that satellites will just get larger over time, even in Leo. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't disagree at all with that. Um, what is the, uh, uh, so, so, so first stage reusable, um, uh, I assume uh, no planned second stage reusability. That's right. So initially, Terranar, we announced, was a fully reusable rocket. So, you know, I, I certainly think, um, yeah, one of Relativity's core values as our company is uh, audacity. And so I think that that was important because I do want to go to where the industry is going. Um, you know, I, I think it's clear, you know, Starship is going to be fully reusable. I do believe in it. I do believe it will be successful eventually. Uh, and so, you know, that that seems like an important piece. But when we actually looked at it again, similar to the Terran 1 to Terran R decision, I think, re- you know, when, when the goal is to go very fast or as fast as possible, focus is important and resource prioritization is very important. And so while full reuse would be very interesting. The business case for it is not nearly as good as a high number of first stage reuses, uh, by the way. So the second stage costs fractions of a first stage. So most of the cost is in the first stage. And so taking the first stage from 10 reuses to 20 is actually a far better economic proposition than even reusing the second stage once from a cost savings perspective. So it's better if you have you know, a, a limited team, limited resources, even if they're quickly growing, to focus them all on making first stage reuse definitely happen and better. And so that's what we decided to do. Um, so it doesn't mean we'll never do second stage reuse. I think life's long and, and I still do believe it can save costs in the future. It's also going to open up interesting business models, whether it's point to point transportation of cargo or in space manufacturing. I do think those are some interesting future growth areas. But right now, right here, the telecom infrastructure moving from Earth into space to augment more space telco infrastructure is absolutely here and coming even more swiftly. You know, year on year, there are more people announcing constellations. India and Mukesh and Bani just announced a constellation in India. Um, there's just more and more demand. Europe has their own they want to do. Of course, there's already Amazon, Kuiper, OneWeb, one of our customers, you know, Iridium uh, is it, it one of our customers with Terran One. Like there's already so many people that are developing these capabilities that, you know, I, I just think our goal is to get to relevant payload mass as quickly as possible. And so that is a combination of when first launches, but not just when first launches, but also the ramp rate. And in, in my, you know, looking at this with our very smart team, uh, the only way to get to a high ramp rate is high reuse pretty quickly. And so, even production volume, even with 3D printing, like none of these technologies, I, I'll just be honest, none of these technologies are going to solve that problem as good as reusing the rocket because then you don't even have to produce anything. You just refurbish stuff and, and fuel it up and launch again. So that, that's really where the focus is. Um, if we're going to have you know hundreds of thousands to, to millions of kilograms of payload anytime soon, which is really what I think the market's going to need. All right. 
Well, Tim, I have a lot more questions about Terranar, but we have to take a quick yeah. break. So just stay with us for a second, and we'll be right back. Space is the new frontier for cybersecurity. To quote the commander of the U.S. Space Force's Operations Command, cyber threats are unfortunately the soft underbelly of our global space networks. Spider Oak, the leader in space cybersecurity software, is dedicated to providing space operators with the solutions they need to protect hybrid space systems. Their Orbit Secure software uses a unique combination of end to end zero trust encryption and blockchain distributed ledger, allowing missions to orchestrate and secure Earth to orbit, orbit to Earth transmission, communication, and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure LEO and hybrid space systems. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero trust security and resiliency to your zero gravity environments, check out Spider Oak at www.spideroak.com. Uh, all right, so Tim, um, I want to talk about um, milestones. Uh, so you have ANR building, you know, a, a whole new engine, which I believe, if I'm, if, if I have my facts right, is more powerful than all of the existing Aeon engines on a Terran One, mm-hmm. a single yes. ANR engine. Um, so uh, that's a huge feat, right? And you're trying to do it pretty quickly because I think your first launch is targeting for tw- targeted for 2026 yeah. um, for Terranar. Um, but up until that point, what are sort of the major milestones, um, at least over the next year, that we should be watching out for? Yeah, of course. So ANR is 258,000 pound thrust. Um, it's a blocks methane engine, gas generator cycle. So it's very, yeah. You know, it's a much bigger engine than Aeon 1, but I would say architecturally it's quite similar. Uh, so it's two turbo pumps, gas generator, um, the methane is, is the regenerative cooling circuit for the engine. Uh, the injector is slightly different type, but overall spiritually very similar to Aeon 1. And so that's helped us go very fast. So this was actually quite intentional. You know, many people at this engine scale are doing stage combustion engines. We looked at it. The, the reason we decided not to do it, even though it's more efficient uh, from an ISP perspective, is it just wasn't worth the development risk and slip and timeline. You know, stage combustion engines are certainly harder to develop because there's more coupled uh, testing that you have to do. And, and the system is just much more sensitive. Gas generator is pretty amazing from the fact that it ends up being very decoupled. You can test the gas generator separately, the valves, the engine chamber, and then put the whole piece together. And then it's very independently tunable. Um, so that ultimately makes it you know, a quite controllable system, um, you know, for things like deep throttling and landing, you know, we, we can really tune it quite, quite well. Um, some of the deep throttling stuff is really in the injector, but, but, but anyway, it's, it's like a pretty proven and robust and reliable system. And so we thought, let's just stick with that. It's going to be the fastest to market. Uh, so far that's paid off. So ANR has been in development for about three years now. Um, we have now tested every major component of the engine at hundred percent power dozens of times. So we've done full thrust chamber tests. We've done full power gas generator cycle tests. All the valves that are in-house developed have been tested. Um, even the turbo pumps we've now tested. We now have a full power power pack together. So this is really effectively the whole engine minus the chamber. So both turbo pumps, gas generator, um, all of that working in sync. Uh, and, and that you know, is a very sophisticated article. When, when you do a 3D printed engine, the first article tends to be very close to what a flight-like engine looks be- because there's really no cost savings to do these heavy development articles that you would normally do out of machined metal. Um, so with printing, you, you kind of go straight to the flight design and then just develop in, in that capacity. Um, but really what's helped us is the, the 3D printing technology helps us iterate the design very, very quickly. So we've built now in, in various forms um, over a, a dozen chambers and, and you know, many, many injector modifications. We can do that uh, on almost you know, a one to two week time scale for even in different injector types and injector modifications. So we're, we're doing tests, getting data and feeding that back into the design based on real world data um, on a just couple month basis. And so that iteration rate compares to a traditional engine, which th- that same cycle may be more on the order of a year or more and so it's just really helped us develop quite quickly. So ANR as a program has reached over 700 tests uh, across all of the different pieces. Um, we're now working with the power pack to, to you know, kind of stair step into more fully integrated testing with the goal of at the beginning of next year doing a full flight duration test of a fully put together engine at full power at 258,000 pounds of thrust. Um, so this is, you know, I think by 
almost any metric you could look at, the fastest large scale engine program ever d developed in the United States um, at this scale. And so the, the secret has been the 3D printing iteration, just the team's experience sticking with the same architecture. Um, I do think companies that are switching from very, very small engines to very large and you know, doing real serious turbo pumps for the first time, even stage combustion engines, like that's going to be really, really hard. It's going to be slow, I think. Right. What, um, um, what type of manufacturing cadence do you expect to have on Terran R at scale? Mm, great question. So we have a million square foot factory in Long Beach, which is Los Angeles area. So this is uh, the old C-17 manufacturing plant. Uh, so built all the largest military Kyger aircraft in the world. Um, that factory footprint can sustain us through about a launch a week. So we're, we're kind of planning our infrastructure plans right now at about a launch a week. Um, so the, the launch that we have in Cape Canaveral, which is an extension of LC-16, where we launched Terran-1, so we uh, are you know, working to build and break ground on the launch site there that would support Terran R. That can support about a launch a week, uh, max cadence. Like we, we feel we, we can get to that point. Um, as we watch Falcon, by the way, and how many launches they're able to get from, you know, their launch infrastructure, I think we can modify our, our goals and plans and certainly increase that number um, if there's creative ways to get to, to faster cadence that we observe. Um, but I think 52 a week, or 52 a year sounds about right. It's Dennis Space Center. We're now the largest commercial tenant to, to really exist there. Um, we just took over one of the space shuttle engine development facilities. So we're going to build the first stage uh, stand there. Um, but I think at Stennis, we also have reasonable, uh, you know, ability with existing infrastructure and with you know any expansion plans to be able to support that. Um, and so, so really, 52 a year. It's just kind of the initial infrastructure. Now, I think from a market demand perspective, we can see very similar launch cadence scaling to what SpaceX is doing with Falcon 9. I think getting to north of 100 launches a year is absolutely possible over the next decade. I think I think 135 is kind of the number that we're throwing out um, yeah. that I think is, is doable. But our whole business model right now is not demand limited, it's supply limited. So it's more how quickly can we build it? And we think based on the conversations we have with, with customers, as quickly as we can build it, we will be able to fly it at this payload class for the foreseeable future. Um, that's really just due, you know, we're under NDA and, and in various conversations with, you know, every Leo satellite constellation and, and Geo and Mio that, that are out there. And so we do know how much are these satellites weighing? What is their plan for Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3? How many satellites are they really planning on launching? And uh, the, 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 the different dynamic this time is these are extraordinarily well-funded companies. Like some of these companies don't even have to make money on the satellites themselves. They're doing it for strategic reasons. Uh, they're, they're working to, you know, the kind of go at scale and, and build a, just a kind of visionary scale and pace that's not really the same as what happened with Teledesic and Iridium back in the, the very early Leo days. And so, uh, yeah, I feel pretty confident the demand is likely to be there, assuming this uh, kind of overall customer condition continues. Yeah. You know, um, uh, I think the Falcon 9. Um, I don't think there's an exact number out there, but I think there's some estimates that the Falcon 9 Block 1 ended up costing something like $400, $500, million, $600 million to get to, yeah. to, get to the pad. Um, and uh, I certainly am not asking you to give me the exact number, but yeah. I'm curious if you can share any type of CapEx or like what kind of capex are you going to need for like Terran R development? Yeah, of course. So, so yeah, uh, yeah, we, we we talk about those numbers too that we've seen publicly out there and kind of kind of uh, you know I'm curious as well what what that costs now inflation adjusted it's about double that of where we're at today in the world versus when Falcon 9 was developed um, so you know a little over a billion dollars uh, but but also that was the initial version I think what we're working to do at Terran R and this is a very tough goal I will absolutely admit it's you know audacious it's it's you know but it's the goal I've set for the team which is how do we get to closer to a block 5 Falcon 9 
almost out of the gate. Like, is there a way now, because we are coming second, you know, it has been many, many years since that rocket flew. I mean, people forget Falcon 9 wasn't even designed to be reusable from the beginning. All of the adding on grid fins and landing legs, that was all trying it as you go. And it wasn't even initially designed for that. Nobody had an idea it was going to work. Like, even when I founded Relativity, I, I left... Um, uh, you know, December 2015 uh, to then start Relativity. And so that was the first month that Blue with New Shepard landed successfully the suborbital rocket. And then right the month after is when Falcon finally landed on the drone ship successfully for the first time. So even when, you know, New Glenn was being architected, no, like Falcon 9 hadn't landed successfully yet. So the world has certainly changed a lot since that happened. But my, my point is, is, um, you know, seeing how things have been done, even from the outside and just you know, watching online, I think has given a view to, oh, this actually is, you know, can work. And, and, you know, there's definitely some optimizations that can happen. So Terranar is, for example, the first stage has aero strikes on the side. So it is actually trimmed a bit flatter. So we're actually going to re-enter, not, not like a full belly flop, but, it's more that direction. And so we actually use air. So it's a higher attack. Yeah. Higher angle of attack. Exactly. So, so yeah, higher angle of attack, that does a few things. So the grid fins are smaller um, and they need to actuate less actively in order to, to trim. So it's a little bit more passively trimmed uh, that also reduces the amount of landing propellant we need. Uh, so, so we end up getting higher payload to orbit in this way. You take a bit more on the reentry uh, aero heating, and so you know thermal protection materials are a little bit more intense. But we we realized we can do that, and we feel confident about that. And overall, it's a more performance system. So that's just one example. I think I talked about the aero uh, landing legs earlier. So they're passively deployed. So it's a simpler deployment mechanism. There, there isn't a telescoping leg members that each need their own individual lockouts. We just have one uh, kind of piece that then slides down. There's more of a slider mechanism. And so that lets us just get rid of some of the complexity of additional mechanisms, uh, additional systems that you know could fail, but Generally, those are proven reliable, I, I think, from what I can observe of Falcon landings. But, but, but it's just a, an additional optimization on top of it. And we can do that from the very beginning. So because we now have foresight that, yes, these kind of, you know, landing leg systems on a drone ship, you know, work, uh, I think we just have more confidence to go ahead and engineer that in from the beginning. So back to your question from a, from a cost perspective, we're actually investing in getting to a highly reusable rocket quite quickly, like definitely on a quicker time period um, than what we've seen in, in, in the world. And so I, I think we're able to do that. It does mean we will spend more money up front, but it's going to be building production capacity and really making sure we're focused on what customers' needs are, which is getting to that high launch cadence and, and reliable capacity quickly. Because... It is true with some of these customers just launching one or two or, or four rockets. It's, of course, they'll take it, but it's not that interesting. Like they need people that can launch, you know, 10 rockets, 20 rockets, uh, because they have pretty big plans and pretty big, uh, you know, th th things that they need. And working with too many different providers to integrate, you know, onesie twosies uh, is, is uh, sort of operationally complex. So, so yeah, that, that is really the goal is we have to get to serious production and launch volume fairly quickly. And so we, we, we need to spend differently and look different in order to do that successfully. Yeah, I think that's super fair. So effectively what you're saying is um, good chance it may be as much or more than Falcon 9 initial development, but you're talking about a completely different launch vehicle, a completely different performance metrics um, and as such, it's going to require a little yeah. bit more investment. I, I think, yeah, the, the headline way to say it is don't think of just getting to first launch, like the first launch cost cited for Falcon 9. Think of getting to the Block 5 capability and how much how much did SpaceX you know, have to invest to get to that. Now, we can 
definitely do less than that because I think we have a more clear roadmap, just the industry is more mature. Um, you know, we, we have other advantages like Terran One and all of the, the money we spent on Terran One did build a lot of the analytical tools, the experience with methane propulsion, the experience with gas generator cycle engines. Uh, there's some stuff we're changing, by the way, from Terran One to Terran R. I think a, an interesting one to talk about is the uh, pressurization system. So Terran One was a what's called a tautonous pressurization system. It's a bit of a technical term, but really all it means is you have liquid oxygen and methane in the tanks, and then you run that uh, cryogenic propellant through a heat exchanger. Um, in the methane case, the engine itself and how you cool it, that is the heat exchanger. It's regenerative cooling, so you gasify the methane, and then you feed that back into the tank to, to keep it pressurized as the liquid level drops. On the oxygen side, you don't have that, so you have to feed it through a, a kind of heat exchanger to gasify some of the oxygen, and that feeds back into the tank. So we thought that was a very simple system. In theory, it actually is quite simple. You don't need helium, carbon overwrapped pressure vessels. That seemed like a big advantage because those are proven uh, you know, unreliable in the past and, and kind of difficult. Um, they cause you know, some of the failures that we've seen. And so we thought getting rid of them would be simpler. As it turned out, with a reusable rocket, this is actually a big challenge because with a reusable rocket, the engine is off for quite some period of time while you're coasting. And so the issue then is the gaseous propellant when it's oxygen on liquid oxygen and methane on liquid methane actually starts re-liquefying and, and, and it's called ullage collapse. And so the pressure in the tanks drops and that is a problem because then when it goes to relight the engines, you won't have enough pressure to, to get the engines lit and, and bootstrap successfully. And so by switching to helium pressurization, which is what we're doing with Terranar, uh, we're able to actually then keep the tanks pressurized even when they're off. So for a reusable rocket, uh, we, we think this is just going to be a much more reliable um, architecture. Uh, it doesn't mean autogenous can't work. It's just a very difficult kind of an analytical problem that Similar to the Terran 1 first launch, it's an analytical problem that you really won't solve until you're flying. And so it's going to take, we think, a few flights for companies to figure this out potentially. And it's just a risk we didn't want to take on. So we're doing something we think is more straightforward and more able to get us into commercial service quickly. Um, so that's just one example of a change. But you know, th there's others. But yeah, I think that's based on experience now. Well, we would do a disservice not talking about um, relativity and, and 3D printing mm. in this conversation. Ah, so um, I, I do want to talk about how the company's use of um, 3D printing additive manufacturing has evolved over the last few years, right? So in the very beginning, it was we're going to 3D print the whole mm -hmm. rocket. Yeah. And there were certain learnings that I think came to a new conclusion and decision. So maybe walk through that a little bit. Yeah, of course. So I think, you know, when I founded the company, I believe our, our very initial tagline, it's probably somewhere on the internet, was, you know, building rockets with zero human labor. Um, so that's where it started. It started with this, you know, very yeah. idealistic, like, you know, Star Trek 3D printing is just going to, you know, pull the whole rocket out of the goo and it's going to be done. And, um, you know, th that's what I thought was legitimately possible on a long enough timeline. I certainly think these, these things are still likely possible, but, um, you know, I think we, we started to grow up a bit. And so we realized, okay, well, 3D printing really is, you know, focused on eliminating fixed tooling and consolidating parts um, and, and saving cost. I think because of the market dynamics that we talked about, that we just need huge amounts of launch quickly and, and reusability is actually one of the key ways to get there. 3D printing has become more of a technology that we're using to iterate very fast to get to a more mature product quicker. So, you know, one thing I've learned, and this is kind of something that we actually talk about internally, it's uh, become, you know, one of those mimetic stories that I, that I want to keep sharing. So I came across a simple example. There was a uh, a professor that did an experiment in an art class. Um, this was an actual study that was done and he split the, the students into two groups and he told both groups uh, to make clay pots. So one group he said, make as many clay pots as you possibly can in an hour and you'll be judged based on how many you made. And then the other group he said, make the highest quality clay pot you possibly can and you have one hour to do it. But at the end, he was actually going to judge them both on quality. He just didn't tell them that. So the what was very interesting is at the end of it, of course, the group, he told them to make a bunch, had a ton. But the last 
pot that they made was judged on quality and it was almost unanimously judged as higher quality than the group that he told make a perfect one and you have an hour. So I think that's kind of a simple example, but one that illustrates iteration and repetition just makes you better, even if you're not trying to be better at quality. And so we're, we're taking this to heart, even with how we're developing Terranar, like the, the first rocket that flies won't be the first version. We're actually designing two versions in CAD and simulation and, and kind of design before we even build the first one. So we already have two iteration cycles, uh, which is different than what we did with Terran 1. And, and we have the team to do it. It's a bigger team. We have more resources. But that's on purpose because I think iteration and building and then going and testing, putting that data back into the next thing that you build and you can test is what works. So 3D printing is just an amazing technology to help accelerate that. Um, it is certainly panning out on the engine production side. Uh, like I mentioned, we've already done you know many, many injector prints. Like We're tweaking that constantly, the geometries, the stability, um, and, and that is panning out. And then we also found that Terran R is a huge rocket. It's 3.3 million pounds of thrust, 18 foot diameter. Uh, the length, you know, we're, we're you know, kind of locking down, but it's around 270 or so feet tall. It's huge. This is a pretty big rocket. And so printing the straight barrel sections, uh, which is probably the, the, the worst case offender of, uh, you know, printing a straight tube, even with stiffeners inside, there is complexity. It is still not straightforward to build. Um, but relative to the rest of the rocket, that was probably one of the weakest areas. And just the sheer quantity of the material supply chain we would have to scale. Um, already, each Terran R is currently built is six times the amount of printed content as each Terran 1. And so building one Terran R is like building six Terran 1s, which were 85% printed already. So it's already a pretty big scaling challenge. And then since we want to be launching, you know, one launch in 26, the, the goal is then to launch, uh, you know, very quick ramp rate from there. It just made sense to use 3D printing more strategically in the areas that we're going to iterate more quickly and we're going to change more quickly. And so that's just where we focus the technology. So I would say this is another case of relativity as a company growing up. Um, I don't think it means we are not still audacious. It doesn't mean, you know, I still very much believe in 3D printing. We're actually using it more in developing more 3D printing technologies that we haven't even announced publicly because there's now, uh, in Terran 1, there were two types of printing. In Terran R, there's really four types that, that were being developed. Um, so we're able to do higher detail at larger scale now. And so that's being used in, in, in the rocket. Um, and so we're continuing to invest quite a bit into this. I think we're just being a little less pathological about it. And I think honestly, sure. that's a good thing. Yeah. So um, I do have, so as far as additive manufacturing, 3D printing is concerned, you, you do, there are a number of now industrial scale, public even mm -hmm. companies that do um, 3D printing and that's all they do. Yeah. Um, what, what's continuing to drive the decision to continue to pour R&D um, dollars into 3D mm. printing technology? Mm. And how do you think about where 3D printing technology is going to go in 10 years or 20 years? Do you think it can get, do you think there's a chance it can get commoditized? Mm. Mm. Or do you really, do you still see it as a, as a meaningful way to build an advantage and a lead over competitors? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll first answer with an observation. So I think, so 3D printing technologies have been around for two decades. I think metal 3D printing specifically has been mature for at least a decade, uh, mostly in powder bed metal printing, which is smaller scale detailed, um, but the tech has been around. I think the fundamental issue with the 3D printing industry is a business model one. So everybody builds printers and tries to sell printers. That's the dominant business model and it's a terrible one. So I think the reason it's terrible, and I saw this firsthand because I started the metal 3D printing division at Blue Origin, got to work with the senior exec team and uh, Jeff to get approval to buy the first printers, really set up bringing that technology in house. And even with that, it, it was hard to get people to adopt it because you have to change your designs. You have to change how you analyze your your product you're building, the design of a printed part it looks very different. If you take a traditional part and say press print, it's horribly expensive and slow. If you redesign the whole product to combine many parts together, 
lightweight it in a very unique looking way, th then you start to get to pretty big advantages, but you have to start from scratch. So it's an adoption friction problem where building a printer and selling it to even a big company like a Boeing or if Relativity were buying printers is, is pretty challenging because it, it, your product will just look different based on what specific system you're actually buying. Uh, they're not really that generalized yet. I, I think they're starting to get generalized in powder bed metal printing a bit more, but large scale printing like what we're doing with Stargate certainly is not generalized yet. And so my point here is the, the companies that even build the printers and sell them just don't capture the value of printing either, by the way, because these machines, you know, let's just say they cost a million dollars. They last five years if you sell one. And so that company made $200,000 revenue per year for the machine, even assuming really good margins, assume they profited $100,000 per year. Well, then you have a company like Relativity using these printers that I can guarantee you we're saving way more than $100,000 per month on every engine we're building. We're building an engine a month per printer. So it's like a huge kind of uh, uh, difference in value capture. I think all the application layer companies or end product companies that use 3D printers to build better products are the ones that capture the value of the 3D printing ecosystem. Um, and then I think all the 3D printer companies struggle with you know, c g training and getting customers to really understand how to use this tech. So it gets relegated to some R&D side lab, usually within a bigger company, or, well, and you spend all your time you know, frustratedly trying to teach customers how to not have failed prints and how to redesign their products to, to not, you know, f not be so expensive when they're printed and how to use the technology. So you're kind of bogged down. And then you have all these printers and all these different shops. And so you can't really do new R&D to upgrade your printing technology. And so what we have seen is, you know, our approach of being the end product user and having our own 3D printing technology abstracted underneath that, we're just using it to build better products. By the way, if we end up using other people's 3D printing technology because it gets commoditized, great. That's not a problem. We're really a rocket launch company at its heart. We're just trying to use 3D printing to build better rockets. And so right now we have to be the inventor of the technology and it is very closely linked to the material science, the flaw detection, the fracture toughness, all of that is very inextricably linked to the design of the rocket itself, the reusability. I mean, we have so many specific things that we care about to make sure this is robust that right now owning it has and inventing it, really inventing it has made sense. If the industry gets to a point in the future, you know, whether it's one year or 10 years where it is commoditized, that you know, p potentially wouldn't be a problem. At least then our products will already have been designed in large part for 3D printing. So whatever tech is out there, we probably are already a head start of adoption. Um, but I think that that's even the pessimist case, honestly, in, in, in that regard, uh, because we are trying to do something that's never been done before. And I think in the grand scheme of the business, it's a worthwhile bet to be on the bleeding edge and push the tech and see how far it can go. We don't know yet. So we're going to continue to push and see how far it can go. But in the meantime, the overall space market and launch market has evolved such that there just needs to be a second great launch company. And that trophy and, and prize is really unclaimed. I think, you know, in large part where I came from at Blue Origin, I think should have been that company. Maybe they still will be. We'll see. Uh, I won't. I won't comment on any specific other entities. But um, yeah, I think Relativity's got a shot. I do think we have a shot, and I think based on the customer traction and 100% win rate across customers so far, uh, you know, it's it's humbling. We've got a lot of execution to do, but I think we do have the highest momentum uh, in the customer segment, which is ultimately what investors will care about. Uh, and, and that that is what matters because, of course, when customers buy launch, they're going to every single launch company. They're looking at everybody's test data. They're walking everybody's factories. They're interviewing everyone's teams and looking at their program plans and their schedules. And they're asking, who is the best to solve my problem? And who is the best company that I am willing to take a bet on and put money down on a contract? And, you know, these are all 65 page long launch service agreements. Like they're very, you know, in depth, detailed uh, purchase orders for launch. So who, who, who do I trust and believe in with that? I, I think um, 
yeah, I've definitely placed a lot of energy and effort in that and understanding customers' needs because I do think that's going to be one of the key things that's helping us uh, you know, get the resources and momentum to, to have a shot to really be a big player at scale. Very, very well said. Uh, I want to talk about marketing. It's actually something that mm-hmm. I don't typically talk about. Um, and, I've, and I've had the privilege of interviewing a number of um, CEOs in the launch space. But I want to talk about marketing because you guys have done such a good job with it. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I feel like was present in the company on day one. Um, how you market the business. I actually remember seeing a Taryn R um, uh, campaign or video from like, I don't know, I want to say a year ago. And it, I remember t- talking to people and saying, that looks like an iPad commercial. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, yeah. think, I think you know, you know which one I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah. But you guys, have, you guys have leaned into marketing in a really unique and special way. And I can't help but think that it sh- certainly has created shareholder value. Um, what Talk to me about that decision process behind, you know, working and working with someone to make Relativity a cool mm. and sexy company. Yeah, so we certainly have had a fantastic team that's helped with marketing and creative and brand through the years. So I have to give them credit. But I also honestly think for me, this is just something that was never a choice when I started Relativity. So my personal background before I got into Rockets, you know, I thought I was going to go to USC and graduate and be a screenwriter. So I've always been in creative fields. I'm married to an artist. So this is something that's honestly just personally fun for me and and a passion uh, of mine. But I will say it is strategic in the sense that you talked about as well. I think um, when you're doing something that's really expensive and has a long time horizon, you definitely need to inspire people and you need to give people something that you know, they can wake up in the morning and be excited that what they're doing is actually meaningful. I don't think that's all marketing, by the way. I think it gets to, you know, is it a really cool engineered product? Like I'm still an engineering geek at heart too. So I kind of have both sides. Um, but I think w- with regard to the industry, it was one of the, the reasons I started Relativity. There were really, the, the two I talk about a lot are watching SpaceX land rocket stock with the space station. They were 13 years old. It was a once in a generation success, even at that point, 13 or eight years ago. And I started Relativity. Uh, they've only continued to, to build that momentum since. Um, but I thought it was depressing that despite that success, they were still the only company in the world that wanted to go to Mars, make humanity multiplanetary. And I thought if that mission is going to happen, they're will probably be dozens to hundreds of companies that work to make that happen, not just one and not even just two. And so if after 13 years of success, nobody had the guts to start the second one, like somebody should probably try to do that. And maybe we'll fail miserably. Maybe 3D printing a rocket will fail miserably. At the time I started Relativity, I didn't know. Uh, but, But I thought somebody needed to take a shot at it. And so I think it's the same mindset when it then comes to building the the creative inspiration around relativity. You know, maybe doing a rocket ad as an iPad, you know, kind of, ad, which that one actually wasn't my idea. I'll give that one credit to the team. Uh, you know, they came up with that autonomously. But I think the core seed of it was I've definitely given the team permission to be creative and try, try to put other sort of things, whether it's more music festival inspired fonts into the, the you know, stuff, or, or I will say the live stream music, music and having a lot of electronic music and, you know, that sort of energy, like that definitely comes from me for sure. I'm a huge electronic music fan. So, so, so like just infusing that kind of energy doesn't cost us anything. By the way, we spend very, very little on marketing. The, the money is like cheap like mar- marketing has, has nothing we're not you know running ads and things like this for a consumer company so it's overall fairly low cost but it's high effort it's high intention and i think the intention is important because i think it's part of our mission and in, in my mind i want relativity to be a commercial and business success so badly uh and we're going to give it our best shot but like i care about building a big company not 
for, for just the legacy of relativity. I actually think it's really important that there is a second company that has that inspirational success that SpaceX gave me. Like, I'll give them credit for inspiring me to even start relativity. But I think that's what's beautiful about it is then you can inspire the next generation. And, and so I do think inspiration is a pretty important part of building a company in space. Uh, it's certainly more inspiring to not have it be renders and, and story. Like, it, it, like, reality is the most inspiring thing you can do. So I think doing it in reality is really important. So I push the team to get results. Like we need to be a real, you know, results driven, executionally focused company. That is, of course, very, very important. I hate this idea of, you know, I think marketing gets such a bad rap because it has this idea of like storytelling and, you know, it's not real. It's a bunch of renders and it's hype and, and that sort of thing. But, but I think that is okay if it comes with a healthy dose of actual execution and real hardware in reality. Um, I don't think you need to look at it as bad if then the actual results fall behind it. Um, but I think it helps create the space and the excitement for people to dream and, and you know, be motivated. Um, and also just, yeah, I think it's fun. I think it just sets you apart. It doesn't take a ton of time and a ton of energy, just a little bit of discipline and intent. Uh, but I think it goes a long way. Even things like our logo, like it's really Earth splitting into Earth and Mars. It's the four phases of colonization of Mars from only Earth to first contact with Mars to a uh, society that is kind of reliant on each other, like a, a bi-directionally reliant society to then fully independent. And in my mind, that was just drawn up early on because I thought that would be a really cool story to tell many years in the future, not from day one, but many years in the future when we had more credibility and that was like a cool Easter egg the whole time that maybe people didn't know about. Um, but I think those kind of things mostly just get people excited. And so why not? Like, why not? Yeah, I didn't. I actually didn't know that. So that's fun. That's an interesting story. And I will tell you, as even by being part of a, a of a media company, I can't tell you the number of times I have to tell and I have to convince people why marketing and, and, and matters. And to your point, it's it's smart marketing. It's not just you know selling snake oil, right? It's 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 yeah, of it's, course. It's, it's 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 wrapping your product with like almost like gift wrap and allowing people to actually understand like what you what, what it is you're doing and why you're doing it and the inspiration yeah. behind it. And there are a lot of founders who take the approach of, well, you know, we're going to do the Elon approach of let the product speak for itself. And I think that that's one methodology. It just is just a lot harder, yeah. and not everyone can pull that off. Also, also, um, hindsight's. Uh can get revisionist history. Don't forget, Elon is the master at actually doing this. Uh, he, he, early on, before SpaceX had a large amount of success, did do things like this. There was a Falcon 1 paraded through Washington, D.C. Correct, and, correct. You know, yep. th th there, were, there were a lot of these things early on. Um, of course, as you get more and more traction and more, more results, it can evolve. And I think you can even see that at relativity. Like now, you know, we are showing I mean, we've done over 700 engine tests and, and engine program tests. And, you know, we, we, of course, also been able to have a healthy dosing of evidence and proof that is indisputable together with the excitement and inspiration and what comes next. So, you know, I, I view it as not one or the other, but it's both in balance. I think if either one gets out of balance, um, that that's probably where it becomes unoptimal. Um but I also think as we've gotten larger, I think there has been more of a bent towards, you know, transparency. Like so certainly we're private. I expect we're going to be private for as long as we you know, can and that it operationally makes sense. It gives us a lot of flexibility, by the way, from the standpoint of even just focus and focus on Terran R. Like, like you hear me say focus a lot because I really just want a team focused on Terran R and, and it's, you know, took them off of Terran 1. I forgot to mention this, but one of the other reasons was Terran 1 even if we did 12 launches between now and the first launch of Terran R, the contribution profit from doing those is still a fairly small drop in the bucket. Like, yeah, it's some revenue, but, you know, a rocket we were selling for $12 million, maybe we could have pushed to 15, the, even if it was quite profitable. Just that amount of money coming in isn't so big that it would have really seriously offset the Terran R program. So, and it would have distracted a lot more. So it was really just these kind of pragmatic 
decisions. And, and yeah, how that relates back to marketing is, is this mix of evidence and pragmatism increasing over time together with, I think we've earned, earned, earned some right to also still be very visionary and, and creative and exciting. Um, again, I think it's just something that is differentiated. And I am curious to see, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm curious to experiment. Like I, I am curious to see as our brand evolves and how we talk about the company evolves, are we able to inspire people in new ways? I think there's been a thought that again, looking at SpaceX is kind of the big, I mean, certainly they're the biggest company in the industry. Um, I'm talking a lot about them for a reason. They're, they're big. They're still very inspiring. I'm still very inspired by what they're doing. I think Starship's really cool. And I think because of that, they have captured the imagination of a certain group of people in the world and in the United States, you know, launching a car on Falcon Heavy, like these types of things, yeah. which are, by the way, marketing. So yeah, you're sure. still doing marketing, I promise, yeah. with the car and Falcon Heavy and, you know, all that. So, so um, it's still happening. But I see so much more potential outside of just their brand and what they've done. So we're doing something very unique. I think putting in more, like I said, film, music, you know, pop culture, that that type of stuff. Uh, I do think there's an opportunity to, to reach a different audience and more creatives. And that that is just a small way to, to with almost no cost, give back and get more people inspired about space. Because I think going to Mars will be a multi-generational action and activity. And I think NASA's PR campaigns kind of like tapped out on the NASA style of doing things. I think SpaceX and Elon is very good at his way of doing things, but I still see so much open space for there to be different ways we think of the intersection of space and culture and humanity that get people ex inspired and excited to be a part of uh, dedicating their lives to making this happen in reality. You know, we talked a lot about inspiration and I would love for you to share a little bit on Relativity's plans with Mars. Right. There's no question. Yes. Um, you've already announced a couple um, partnerships around mm -hmm. Mars and what that looks like. And I also want you to. Uh, um, I also want to get your thoughts on one thing, which is you're building a massive launch vehicle in Terranar. Mm -hmm. I can't help but think that you're, there's no way you're not thinking of something bigger at some point. Is that oh, something? <laughs> is that something that's on your mind, especially as you couple that with the vision for Mars? Yeah. Um... You know, for as audacious as relativity is, I haven't thought of a bigger rocket than Terranar. Not like fundamentally bigger. I think Terranar will continue to evolve, by the way, and we will have, you know, block upgrades and I'm sure the pay payloads getting larger will always happen. It's not as much Mars driven, although certainly it benefits that. I think it's um, uh, like a lot of the uh, mentioned earlier of satellites just getting larger generation to generation for constellations. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of like th thrust increases, like maybe it gets a little longer. Um, there's other weight optimizations and things that go in efficiency, efficiency optimizations. But yeah, I think with Mars specifically, so you referenced, uh, you know, we, we have announced uh, probably the biggest um, partnership we have is with Tom Mueller's company Impulse. So Tom Mueller was the uh, propulsion CTO and one of the co-founders of SpaceX. He was there for almost two decades, so a very long time. Um, and he uh, started his own company, Impulse. So they do in-space transportation. Uh, they're building a variety of services. And what the, the mission is, is the first privately funded mission to Mars. So, you know, they, again, I certainly think I, I actually haven't tracked if they've announced it. I know there's been various things through the years like Red Dragon and other stuff that was going to go to Mars, but I would bet SpaceX is, you know, going to launch something to Mars at some point soon. Um, but, but we wanted to do a slightly different mission. So what we're doing is more of a traditional JPL style uh, aero entry capsule and uh, lander. So this is a very small payload. We, we haven't, you know, kind of formally said what it is, but I would bet it's in the realm of 
50 kilograms to the to the Mars surface of useful payload, like that kind of size, approximately. And Tom Mueller's company is developing the Mars transfer vehicle, which is very similar to the tech they're building for their commercial business anyway. And then the the aero entry capsule. And we're you know looking to work with JPL and NASA and other partners to hopefully leverage some of the existing U.S. technology on this, just to make it easier uh, and, and more likely to to um, be able to work on a first go. Um, but we have several launch windows, so we have exclusivity with them through 2029. Uh, the next window, we've got one in 2026. Um, so that may just make it on a first launch. We'll see. Um, but then certainly the, the window that comes after, we should be well into tearing our operations then. Um, I think that's important, though, that there's, again, kind of diversified capability of, of sending payloads to the Mars surface. I think from a, a business perspective, more than just it's very cool, um, I think governments around the world, including the U.S. government, you know, we're doing this a bit speculatively, but there is a, a program in the U.S. called CLIPS, which is um, commercial lunar payload services so to the, the moon surface, um, that if there was a similar low cost commercial way to send payloads to Mars surface, that there would be governments and other corporate entities around the world that would be interested in doing, you know, fractions of the cost, uh, lower you know, like re research and development um, for the Martian surface. So that's really where that partnership is focused. Um, we are starting to have you know, early conversations with certain space agencies uh, around the world. Certainly there's interest in this. Um, so I don't think it's such a crazy idea. It's a you know, pretty challenging engineering mission, certainly. Um, but again, I think it's a worthy one and one that we're putting some resources behind uh, while still making sure, you know, for relativity, it's not so unique. It's it's like just the payload that's different. You know, the Terran R launch vehicle is the exact same as what we'd use to launch any other mission. So really for us, there's no additional work to, to do this. Um, it's just a focus and, you know, we're certainly close with Tom's team and, and kind of meet with them on a frequent basis about this mission. So we are engaged with them quite heavily on it and engineering teams talking uh, to, to progress it. But other than that, there's, it's really the same launch vehicle we'd use for anything else. My uh, second to last question um, is, uh, are, is, is there going to be a Stargate or a version of Stargate that's on Mars in the next Call it two decades. Uh, yeah, I think, um, well, I think as a candidate for that first payload, it would be really small, It'd be like, uh, you know, ultra mini Stargate um, or, or some form of 3D printer. But I think that could be cool. It'd be the first object ever manufactured on another planet by humanity. Like, it's a pretty cool milestone. So I think that's possible. Yeah, amazing. Well, um, I, I do have to, uh, you, you said something that was almost quite literal music to my ears, which is, uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned electronic music. I actually mm -hmm. um, used to produce dance music in a, in a oh, form no of life. Oh, that's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a conversation for another day, but I got to ask, yeah. what is your, who are your favorite artists? Who are you listening to? Uh, Who's yeah. getting you pumped to build a rocket? <laughs> Man, who am I listening to right now? Well, um, maybe controversial, but uh, yeah, B Bass Nectar just got or came came back so yeah uh, let me let me see who else um oh gosh there's so many um if yeah, you were if, 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 if relativity was throwing a big blowout we got to tear in our party who's djing that party yeah <laughs> it, ass assu that assuming they were free <laughs> yeah who's our, yeah. who's our dream person uh yeah. you know i always thought gestoffelstein would be a pretty cool like uh, yeah, he's just so edgy you know um, yeah, yeah. but i kind of like that like it's it's like very edgy uh rufus du soul they're not exactly electronic but i do love them they're they're pretty phenomenal um yeah, Skrillex Ford's hat, like those live sets are just really, really good. Uh, they're actually a pretty great DJ duo. Um, I haven't seen Fred again yet, but, you know, heard, heard very good things. Um, also, it's funny because, you know, so Circle, I don't know if you know the, the, the yeah, brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, they do, they do their events. They do a big event every year at the European, um, it's like the uh, equivalent of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum for Europe. Oh yeah, and I've heard they, of this. I've heard of they're this. They're doing everyone next year, and I was always thinking, how cool would it be if one of the rocket launch, one of those rocket companies or rocket launch startups in the U.S. threw like a big event, something like that, right on their facility with like a yeah. backdrop 
like a couple rockets in the background. So it would be cool. Someone, I, you know, like, yeah, it, it would be cool. Yeah, I love like Seven Lions. I, there's so many people, but um, yeah, I think I, I think the last I counted. Now I will say during Relativity, it's real small because I just haven't had the time to go to many live events. But even before that, I think I'd been to like 300 shows, so it was a pretty huge number. Um, but uh, yeah, I do remember actually um, in college when I was at Blue Origin, we had a chance to launch a payload on the suborbital rocket. So one of the photos that I sent was uh, me at a Bass Nectar concert and the live visuals behind him was a space shuttle launch happening. And so that was kind of this idea going back to creativity and inspiration, like why do this? Like why even focus on this? So I was in college doing nuclear physics homework and listening to bass nectar and going to live shows. And that was very inspiring for me. That was a big motivation for, okay, why do I want to put humanity on Mars and go to the cosmos? Like, why am I working so hard to engineer these products? Like really the, the core desire for me isn't just practical backup civilization. You know, what if an asteroid destroys us? Like, candidly, in the next couple of hundred years, we're going to destroy ourselves way more likely than an asteroid destroys us. Um, so I, I just don't see that as ultra logical. But I do like this argument of expanding human consciousness. And, and for me, it's about expanding the possibilities of human experience. Like, if there were a million people on Mars, just the music, the culture, the creativity that we create, it, it's quite existential. But We've been on Earth for thousands of years, many generations living and dying, and, and and we live at a time where we can actually become a you know single cell organism to multi cell organism. That's very cool. And so for me, li listening to this music and in college and kind of having some of these more philosophical thoughts, I then took that photo of me at the concert. I actually gave it to Bass Nectar's team and gave it back to him with this story that I was like, hey, we launched this to space because I was inspired listening to your stuff. And how often is it people in the audience get to give back something that they created because of the inspiration to the artist that made it? Then at Relativity, we ended up licensing a Bass Nectar song called Nothing Has Been Broken. That was one of our early, early videos. It was like, you know, 2000 bucks or something, not super expensive, but we licensed it for the video. And again, this is just this kind of cycle of inspiration from artists to scientists, engineers, and then being able to give that back because then we're actually accomplishing things in reality, which inspire artists. So I just like this idea of creativity and the inspiration cycle. I think if we're going to go to Mars and do something that hard, it's going to take a huge dollop of kind of irrational inspiration as a society. Um, but it's important society has a North Star and humanity has a North Star to go after that unifies us. And I think with uh, social media and content and all, all of that, it's like very noisy right now. So I think having something that's so inspiring and we talk about the inspiration as a product itself is pretty important uh, because that's what's going to get the momentum behind us in this mission to actually make it happen. So I, I do think it's part of it. I couldn't agree more. Tim, this is a great conversation. I loved it. Thanks yeah, for taking of course, the time. Man. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you. Really, really appreciate it. And looking forward to having you back here soon. All right, we will. Thanks so much.